You just wrote a beautiful web app using Pure Rust. In this video, we're gonna walk through how to keep the creepy users out of it by adding authentication. It can be really tempting to write authentication from scratch in your web app. All you need to do is have the user send their password hash and compare it against the password hash that you have in the database, right? Then maybe create a session ID that you associate with that user in the database, which the user will send with each backend API request they make. The thing is, it's hard to justify writing auth from scratch these days when it's so easy to rely on an external provider to handle everything. Sign up, authentication, password recovery, etc. Plus, it usually negates the need for your users to create a new account to use your application, which can be a huge barrier in getting people to use your app. A technology called OAuth2 has become a standardized way for apps to delegate authorization to a third party. While it was originally intended for just authorization, a few small additions can make it suitable for authentication as well. Another technology called JWT tokens, or JSON Web Tokens, can be used in conjunction with OAuth to allow your web application to verify a user's identity and authentication status. Using cryptography, your web application can verify them without even having to make a request to the authentication provider. The way this works is that when the user wants to log in, your app directly them to the authentication provider's login page with some of your application details in the query parameters. Once they successfully authenticate, they are redirected back to your app with an authorization code. Your app then needs to exchange this authorization code for refresh and access tokens. You'll need to create an API in your backend to facilitate this that will essentially proxy the request to the authentication provider. The access token is what your front end includes in backend requests as proof of the user's identity. Your backend can validate this token without contacting the authentication provider. Again, don't worry too much about the details. It'll become clear in a minute. In this video, we're going to use the U framework for our front end, which is the most popular framework for building a front end in Rust. There's a crate called UOAuth2 that handles most of the OAuth logic on the front end for us. We're going to use Actix Web for our back end, but you can use the same approach with whatever back end framework you like. Whatever framework you choose, make sure it's configured to serve your front-end files. For our third-party OAuth provider, we're going to use AWS Cognito, but our approach won't be specific to Cognito and should work with most OAuth providers. Don't worry if you're not familiar with any of these frameworks. You'll still be able to follow along. We have a blogging website that we want to add some very simple authentication to. Without logging in, you won't be able to view any blogs. Once logged in, you'll be able to view any blog you like. First, in your front-end crate, you'll need to add UOAuth2 to your dependencies. This crate provides some U components that make managing authentication state a bit easier. The core component that UOAuth2 provides is the OAuth2 component. It has a config attribute that allows you to specify your OAuth configuration. There's three pieces of configuration you'll need, a client ID, an auth URL, and a token URL. The first two will come from your OAuth provider. Setting up an OAuth provider is outside the scope of this video, so we'll assume you already have that set up. In the case of Cognito, your client ID can be found in your app client, and the auth URL is your Cognito domain postfix with slash login. The auth URL will point to an API we'll create later in our backend. We'll put the API at slash API slash token, but you can use whatever path you like. Inside the OAuth2 component, we can use the authenticated and not authenticated components. The contents of the former will only render when the user is authenticated, and the latter when the user is not authenticated. The crate also provides functions that initiate the login and logout process. We'll put these in callback functions that we can refer to from our HTML. In the not authenticated component, we'll add a login button that runs a login callback upon being clicked. In the authenticated component, we'll add a logout button, and below that, our router will display the contents of the current route. Now down in our blog component, we have a function called getBlog that retrieves a blog's contents from the backend. We want to send the access token in a header so that the backend can verify that the user has authenticated. To do that, we'll add a token parameter and add the contents of that parameter to an authorization header in the get request. For the sake of brevity, we'll omit the error handling for now by calling unwrap. Technically, we should be prefixing the token with the string bearer, but we'll omit that for brevity as well for now. With UOAuth2, credentials are stored in a U context so that they can be made available to all components beneath that top level OAuth2 component that we talked about. To get at this U context, we use the use context hook. The access token function of the OAuth2 context struct provides the credential we need to send to the backend. So we'll pass that to the get blog function. Okay, that should do it for the front end side of things. Now on to the backend. OAuth requires our app to be served via HTTPS because sensitive data is passed around using query parameters. You can make Actix Web HTTPS capable by adding the OpenSSL feature to Actix Web and also the OpenSSL crate as a dependency. There's a crate simply called OAuth2 that will allow us to create an auth endpoint for exchanging an auth code for access and refresh tokens. Lastly, we'll add JSON Web Tokens Cognito as a dependency. This is a thin wrapper on top of another crate simply called JSON Web Tokens. This 
This crate provides Cognito-specific JWT token verification. You'll need to generate a self-signed certificate for Actix Web to use when testing locally, which you can do by running this OpenSSL command. Make sure you configure your browser to trust this certificate. The steps for doing that vary by platform. Prior to setting up our Actix app, Create an SSL acceptor builder that loads the private key and certificate that you just created. Then, when you're creating the HTTP server, call bind underscore OpenSSL instead of bind and pass the builder in as a second argument. At this point, Actix Web should be HTTPS ready. Now we need to create a new endpoint for exchanging the auth code for access and refresh tokens. The front end can't make this request to our OAuth provider directly because of cores, so we need to create a sort of proxy endpoint. It'll take a few fields as input and return a standard token response that contains the access and refresh tokens, among other things. Create an OAuth2 basic client, passing in your client ID, client secret, and token URL. In the case of Cognito, your token URL is your Cognito domain with slash OAuth2 slash token token appended to it. You'll need to specify a value for the auth URL field, but the contents of that doesn't matter because we won't be generating an auth redirect URL on the back end. Then we'll exchange the access code for the tokens and return that to the consumer if all went well. At this point, we've set up everything the client needs to retrieve credentials from our OAuth provider. The only thing remaining is to secure our backend APIs by verifying the JWT token that was sent in the authorization header by our front end. With Actix Web, the cleanest way to do this is probably to implement some middleware that can be reused by all the APIs. But for simplicity's sake, we'll just implement it directly in the get blog API. Import the key set struct from the JWT Cognito crate. Pass your Cognito region and pool ID to the key set new function. Then create a token verifier by passing in your Cognito app client ID. Now the verifier has all of the information it needs to verify the signature of a JWT token. Finally, call keyset.verify, passing in the contents of the authorization header and the verifier. If verification fails, you'll want to return the appropriate HTTP response. If it succeeds, you know the token in the header was procured by the OAuth provider. Depending on the security needs of your application, you may need to scrutinize the contents of the token a bit more before considering the request authorized. Guidance on best practices here are outside the scope of this video, but this is a good starting point. This brings me to an important point about JWT tokens in general. It's important to note that because verification happens without making any requests to the OAuth provider, there's effectively no way for the provider to immediately revoke an access token. That means that your backend APIs may continue to authorize requests for a short time after the user has logged out. For many applications, this may be acceptable, but it's something you'll need to consider. If you'd like more details on setting up Actix Web or you, I'll include links to relevant videos in the description. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.